there. So you probably have just received, if you're participating in the workshop, a little notice that the recording has been has begun, if you'll just click that. Um, and if you're joining us uh, digitally later, I'm glad that you are. Um, we've got a group of teachers together today, and we're going to be exploring the idea of analyzing systems of power through artworks. Um, and uh, I think what I'll share at the start is that I've heard over and over again from APOS history teachers how difficult the continuity and change over time question is. And if your brain just was like, I'm not an APUS history teacher, I don't do the continuity and change over time question, don't worry about it. The, the core of this, this um, workshop is just going to be helping students unpack the idea that some stuff changes and some stuff stays the same. And often it's easier to see the change than it is to see the things that stay the same. And what I wanted to do was examine systems of power as a way to get at this, what changes and what stays the same, particularly because underneath the uh, continuity and change over time question is what has allowed things to stay the same or enabled things to stay the same and what has allowed or enabled things to change. So we're gonna be kind of exploring that idea um, through two artworks. The way that we're going to structure this time together is we're going to look closely at one artwork. And for some of you who are familiar friends, who I'm always glad to have familiar friends in our, class, in our classes and workshops, um, this is gonna be a very familiar artwork, but I'm going to be going at it with a systems approach rather than kind of a design or aesthetic approach. And then we're gonna connect it to another artwork that is directly connected from a content perspective, but represents something, another facet. And when we get to that point, I'm going to ask you to apply the thinking that we did with that original, maybe familiar artwork more independently with a second artwork. So the idea is that I am hopefully giving you a tool and then giving you an opportunity to use that tool independently and just see how it feels. And at that point, if you wanna put on your teacher hat, great. But at this point, I'm just gonna invite you to um, engage as um, peer learners together because I always learn a bunch from you. Um, the thinking routine that we're going to use is from Harvard's Project Zero. It's a specifically an agency by design thinking routine. And the intention between, behind, excuse me, agency by design is to call students and our own attention to the designs in the world, like that pretty much everything we live around and within is a human designed thing. And when we're aware of that, we recognize, ah, oh, in fact, these things were made, which means they can be changed. So um, here we go. Let's get started with the uh, artwork analysis. Um, here is our perhaps familiar artwork. Um, I am going to invite you first to just look. And if you need to move things around on your screen because you've got a lot of stuff open, that's great. Please take care of whatever you need to do so that you can see the whole artwork. And I'm going to invite you to take your hands away from your pencil or pen, away from your keyboard and really devote your attention to your eyes at this point. And just look at the artwork all over. If we were together in real life, it would be immense. It's a very large artwork. Um, and the invitation at this point is to look slowly and intentionally so that you see everything. And we're gonna distinguish between observing and interpreting in this step, just so that we are noticing all the stuff the artist put together. And then we're gonna start telling stories about it. So now that you've had a chance to look, my invitation to you is to go to your piece of paper and your pencil or pen and write down a list of as many things as you possibly can. I'm gonna put on a timer for a full minute. And my invitation to you is that you just put down as many things, observations as you possibly can in that minute. Um, again, at this point, we are not interpreting the artwork. We're just making a list. So I'm bringing up my timer, so I'll keep myself honest. Ready, set, go.
You have 20 more seconds. So before you put anything more in the chat box, just keep writing, just fill it, fill it, fill it, fill it. your list on your paper with like the, all the things you could possibly come up with. Sometimes the minute feels really fast and sometimes it feels really slow. So if, you, if there's one more thing that you meant to put down on your list, please feel free to do so. And then as you see on the screen, I'm gonna ask you to assess your list. And I'm gonna challenge you to choose the three most important things and put those in the chat box. So this move, just again, to teach or talk to you a little bit while you're doing it, which I apologize, is really more for the people watching the video, but um, this move is intended to get you looking all over and then to start to prioritize and recognize that certain parts of the artwork seem to have maybe some more either visual weight from aesthetic perspective or some kind of conceptual weight, something that seems particularly essential to understand. So in the chat box, three most important things, if you would, please. Christy started us off with the color blue or colors blue, um, the corners themselves and the letters. Andy, ah, license plates in alphabetical order with the old New Jersey plates. Um, state license plates, Joe's adding in alphabetical order. Helene's doubling down on that, but adding lines of five or six plates with lots of white. Chanda is noticing half words and some uniformity, the color of green, some white backgrounds. Uh, noticing that the words form the constitution or words of the constitution. Marita's noticing nine rows. Um, Julianne is zooming in specifically on the state names. Some things are non-words, it's all capital letters. Um, ah, uh, Booth, we've got this beautiful idea of um, how many words are contained within the license plate. Beautiful, like close counting. I really appreciate that. Anything more that needs to be added that hasn't been added yet that seems particularly important? Jot it down in the chat. Ah. Beautiful, so noticing some absences. And this is a really interesting challenge. The invitation to look often just to, like generates a lot of stuff that we can all point to, which is great. But the calling attention to those absences is equally important. So we have the idea um, that while DC is represented in this artwork, Puerto Rico and other US territories are not. So that's, it. that's an important distinction. Okay, anything more? I wanna make sure I don't leave anybody behind. Preamble, ah, beautiful peer, thank you. So we have, an, it's not just the constitution, it's in fact a specific part. And I think maybe Joe mentioned that at the top. Um, the words are divided and these rows seem to be important too. Beautiful. So we're starting to think um, kind of about the organization. We mentioned alphabetical order. We, we mentioned the number of license plates per line. Um, and then also recognizing that because of the phrasing of these words, um, some of them are broken over multiple license plates. So that's, that's interesting to me anyway. Um, next step is to look back at all of the stuff that we just wrote, because we together just documented like pretty beautifully, I think, um, the, the contents of the artwork. Um, and my next challenge for you is not to necessarily say what it is, but what is the message of this artwork? And I'm gonna distinguish between the thing it is because we've named that it's the preamble of the Constitution of the United States, but like what's the message that goes with this particular arrangement, this particular choice of materials, you said license plates, for instance, um, what is kind of the, the deeper meaning for you? Beautiful, thank you, Narita. Thank you for leading us off. Oh, interesting. I love, I love what just happened. So already what seems to be a familiar 
set of phrases, what seems to be a familiar object, like license plates, like, you know, that sort of thing. We're already noticing that in the chat box right now are some ideas that kind of tussle with each other. They kind of push and pull. Um, so the word unity is coming across, unity across the land, the document protects us all, there's connection, um, the constitution applies to all these different places. But then we also have the kind of the, the flip side of unity, kind of a confinement perhaps. Um, there's also division within that unity. Um, noticing, Helene notices for instance, that not even one small phrase is fulfilled by a single state. Um, and then Andy's adding the idea, all states contribute to and benefit from the goals of the preamble. So there's, there's what seems to be perhaps a pretty straightforward idea has a little bit of complexity to it. And just for clarity's sake, if you haven't seen it already, if we start at the top left, it reads, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Julian's adding, um, using license plate to unify brings the idea of the open road that connects us. So that's an important component that's a little bit hard to read um, in this reproduction, but if you've seen it in real life, the, this immense sized artwork is in fact in kind of the shape of um, uh, interstate highway sign with those curved corners that Christy, who's seen it before in person, might have noticed the, the curved corners. And it's that um, green of an interstate highway sign, but it's in fact this kind of plush vinyl, right? Like the seat in a car in the Volvo station wagon that I grew up driving in, for instance, that got super hot in the Virginia July. Um, Masami is adding, I think maybe it's a commentary on time and the continued and current relevance of the ideas of the preamble. Beautiful. Um, so we've got these interpretations, right? So we've looked closely, we've started to tell stories or, or messages um, about this artwork. And just again, to emphasize that distinction between naming what it is and inviting us into this idea of the artwork sharing the message, just to kind of call that out. Um, the next step in our thinking routine is to add context. And rather than doing that on this slide, I just wanna give you um, like an explicit moment that if you've been wondering, like, well, at what point do I provide a little bit of content? Um, this could be your moment. Or alternatively, if you were doing work together with students on the preamble or the particular time period that we're about to discuss, this would be an opportunity to ask them to start to apply that thinking and listen for, did they get the high notes, right? So this is your formative assessment point. Um, so this artwork was made um, in 1987. Um, and of course, with any um, historical um, analysis, we would want to start to think about not only when the preamble was written, um, edited, ratified, etc., but we would also want to think about the time period that the, the artwork depicting it was made in and recognize that something happened and then 100 and whatever years later, my math is terrible, don't quote me on that. Um, we, we were still revisiting that idea, but particularly using this set of materials. We would also wanna notice that in any case, like who is the audience or who kind of paid for the, the thing. In this case, this particular artwork came into our collection by way of the Nissan Motor Corporation of the United States. So we're, start, or in the United States rather. Um, so we're starting to kind of pick up the edges of just kind of the, the routines that a historian takes on when looking at any new document. But the thing that I'm going to invite you to do is to call your mind back if you are my age um, or older to the 1980s. Um, and the question becomes, what do you know about the 80s? And it can be anything. So like, for instance, I know that my mom had a really cool hair dryer. And I really want that hair dryer. That is part of the 80s for me. Um, I could put that in the chat box. Or alternatively, I could put something more like Marita did, thank you, that um, we have Ronald Reagan in the White House at that time. So anything that comes to mind when you think of the 1980s, will you drop that in there? Oh my golly, look at this. Okay, so we have um, beautiful women could finally get a credit card without their husband's signature. Um, Joe graduated high school, awesome. Um, economic prosperity, but then also Andy is adding this idea, greed is good. Um, so there seems to be some kind of push and pull there. 
um, rock music, we have Pac-Man, so uh, neon, so there's like a, a pop culture component of the 80s. Um, but then also mentioning, um, oh, MTV, beautiful. Um, and we're also noticing some really big crises. So we have um, rainforest deforestation. We have, we have also um, the AIDS crisis at that time. So um, let me give you a, a perhaps a bigger list. So the artworks that you see on the right side were all made um, in the 80s as well. So I just want to like start to, to touch on the idea that like not, I, I mean, this is obvious, but like not all the artwork from the same time period looks the same way. And these artists were depicting other kind of things, right? Um, but a quick look at kind of just regular, easy to access timelines from the period in US history. Um, throughout the 80s, we're going through the Cold War, um, the rise of the moral majority, the attempted ass assassination of President Reagan. We have Sandra Day O'Connor coming into the Supreme Court. We have the debut of MTV. We have Reaganomics, the AIDS crisis, personal computers, the Just Say No campaign. We have Geraldine Ferraro coming up as the first um, female VP candidate, the Iran-Contra affair, the Challenger explosion, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the 80s is like, there's a lot happening in the 80s, right? And when we start to start to look at this context, this is the, you know, 1987 when the artwork was made. Um, that's the world that's operating kind of outside of the artwork or around the artwork, right? Um, so setting the artwork in context, then we start to perhaps think a little bit more about well, what? So when you see this context, like what questions start to percolate in your mind, either about the time or about the artwork? And you're welcome to unmute and share aloud or alternatively drop things in the chat box. What questions are percolating for you at this point? Ah, we want to know were words as popular in art before this? Is there something to do with the erosion of ethics and values? I like this. Other queries, questions. Mm, thinking about what's the relationship to advertisement history. So like what's happening in advertising in the 80s? And then alternatively, we could look at that question. Um, does the artist have a relationship with advertising? Um, questioning commercialization and corporations, beautiful. Is there an increase in political art at the time? Attention with the art market, awesome. Keith Herring, thank you. Yes, so our artist on the bottom right is Keith Herring. Um, on the bottom left is Esther Hernandez. On the top left is um, Jean Quick to see Smith and the top right is Barbara Kruger. So we have four different artists depicted here who were operating at the same time as our license plate artist, um, Mike Wilkins. Okay, so we've got some wonders. Um, we're gonna move into a place where we're starting to think about kind of ever more the world outside the artwork and how the artwork is both a product of and a reaction to its time period. Thank you, Marita. So now we're thinking about color culture. Um, so which systems does the artwork invoke or challenge? So my challenge to you is to put as many as possible in the chat box before we worry about the people. In addition to car culture, which systems does the artwork invoke or call to your mind or challenge? Ooh, language. What additional systems? And just for like clarity's sake, when I'm saying systems, what I mean is anything wherein smaller parts work together with specific purposes to serve a purpose even larger than they might be able to serve independently. So little bits working together to make something bigger happen. Um, ah, so not only English language, but thinking about proper versus informal language, economic status. 
um, prisons. So he, we hear about license plates being made in prisons. Um, time, I love this idea. There's a system of time operating there. Like in fact, some of these license plates have the sticker that say the, the, the year on them, right? Um, thinking more and more about the prison system, the system of registering cars, like right now in this particular time period, um, the DMV, the next DMV appointment that we can get is in January. So that feels like a million miles away. Um, so thinking about legality or Ill illegality, right? So the purpose of a license plate is to say that this car is registered, this car is legal, this car can be operating on the road. Um, if it's not there, then it's not there, right? Um, Chanda, thank you. So thinking about social media, even even though it wasn't in in uh, it wasn't available in the 80s, um, this idea of like this something about this being like early tweets for sure totally makes sense. Okay, so we have all these systems, right? Um, my challenge to you is um, to think about who is involved in one of these systems, like just choose a system that's that's of curiosity to you. So scroll up through the chat box and think about the systems that are that kind of provoke some curiosity in you. And then just spend a full minute in the chat box, like name the system, and then just make as long a list as possible of all the people who are involved in that particular system. So for instance, if I was thinking of social media or early social media or just like conversation, um, I might think of the, the person speaking, the person receiving the information. I might think of bystanders. Um, I might think of the people who taught me to speak English um, and whether they be at home or at school, um, the people with whom I converse in the particular ma manner that I'm speaking right now. So fairly formally versus people who I might speak more informally to. So this is like the unpacking that I'm asking you to do. It's like really imagine that you can unfold this and that there's just more folds and keep unfolding. Um, and I'm gonna put a minute on the clock. Your instruction at this point is to choose a single system from the chat box and in the chat box name as many people who are involved in that system as possible. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you guys are so amazing. So um, aside from it being, you know, 4.30 on an, on an afternoon after a million things that I'm sure you've done, um, you're really going really big. So um, to grab a couple of things that are in the chat box, um, two folks chose the prison system. Um, and in one case, um, reflecting on prisoners, guards, cooks, lawyers, chaplains, healthcare workers, wardens, maintenance crew, attorneys, right? So we have like, this is a, it's getting bigger and bigger kind of, um, we're starting to recognize there's a lot of people in a lot of different places. Um, Christy is noticing um, civil servants, unregistered persons, immigrants, persons fleeing abuse, lawmakers, lawyers, politicians, and this idea of legal versus illegal. Um, Julianne is adding to the conversation of um, prisoner, pr the prison system um, with taxes. So that in, then implies taxpayers um, as well. Um, Chanda is going beyond the life in the prison and thinking about group homes afterwards. So now like that's getting us into the community, right? So when we start to look at the, this kind of way of unpacking the people in the system, we start to recognize that these giant mega systems um, that can often feel quite far away are actually made up of people and individuals who have either designed the system collectively um, on purpose, collectively, 
sort of accidentally, however we want to look at it, but then also the people who who are affected by those systems or work alongside them, right? Like this is all people working together. Um, and I love if you scroll back through the chat, there's, there's a really beautiful dissection of formal versus informal language, the highway system. Um, we're noticing also car culture, right? So thinking about um, car culture as a status symbol, status of course being a system of its own, um, the people who participate in that particularly upper and middle class. So right well, now we're starting to like really see like how big and broad we can go with this. Um, so then, Here's the quote, the query and the challenge, right? We started out with a conversation about the preamble and thinking about how the preamble sets up kind of the meaning of the constitution or what the constitution is up to. And then we are starting to think at least in a quick write about what is the, the impact of the constitution on regular everyday people. So the intention of this particular thinking routine is starting to recognize that there are these big systems and each of those systems do in fact impact most people. Um, and instead of going back all the way to the Constitution, I just wanted to be transparent for you there. What I want you to do is to continue on your piece of paper following the path that you've already set for yourself. So for instance, uh, Marita's mentioned car culture. So Marita would go onto the map and start to think about all the people identified in that reflection. How do they interact with each other and make a map? And think about, is their power moving from one person to the other person or from the other person to one person, or is it going back and forth and actually draw some lines that would indicate the flow of power or resources, whatever way you think is the easiest way to start to think about that. Um, and then once you've done that, revisit your quick write. And now that you've kind of done this dissection of the, the systems and the people and the systems, can you add any new ideas to your thinking about the constitution? I'm gonna put two and a half minutes on the clock, which is gonna be unfortunately quite short, but we'll see what we get to. And if you have any questions because my directions weren't clear, um, feel free to either unmute your microphone or pop them in the chat box. And if you're like me and you process better visually than you do auditorially, I've put the um, kind of refined or uh, revised, clarified uh, depth in the chat.
าทางไฟจะเริ่ม start finishing there's a silly way to say it if you'll bring that thought to a pause just there for a minute beautiful thank you chanda this idea of the the movement of um of uh, struggle and power um justice injustice lies in truth innocence and guilt beautiful thank you so um Something that I'll call out to you, which I think is really um, an interesting way to think about power or resources, um, and it operates within the agency by design system, is when we start to think of these arrows, we can think of these arrows um, in a couple of different ways. And I put them in the chat box, but I'll read them aloud. Um, power over is one way of thinking. Power to is one way of thinking. Power with um is a very different way of thinking and power for just so just unpacking that idea that um when we think of power over and we limit our conversation to power over it becomes about who has power and which sort of one way direction does it go whereas if we start to think about power with um, we give ourselves more of an opportunity to see agency our agency within the system or an individual's agency within the system so i just want to call that out there um, so even if you didn't get to the part about the, the quick write and revisiting it and adding new ideas or whatever, um, my query for you, uh, just a chat box question so that we can all kind of see each other's thinking as Shonda did, um, will you add a new idea that you have about the interplay of systems of power and people within those systems? Like, what are you thinking about the role of people within these power structures? Thank you, Marita. You you have anticipated my question beautifully. What what new ideas do you have about the interplay of people and these systems of power? So Christy's adding this idea of energy, like uh, energy of attention, and and where that attention should be directed. Um, so interesting to think about um, class structure and thinking about who want who feels able to or wants to um, move up in the world and what that kind of the cost of that is and whether there is protection for those folks. Thinking about who has power being that power being centralized in a particular um, generally smaller section, um, whereas the greatest population seem to have perhaps less power anything more any new ideas that you have at this point about the interplay of people and systems of power ah julianne's thinking about the kind of the foundations and is the meaning um overlooked or or kind of what's the what's the what's happening with this idea of greater meaning or ideal um Oh, Joe, holy guacamole. So Joe has this idea. What keeps coming up for me is the extent to which the ideas of the constitution and the rights guaranteed to the excuse, accused, excuse me, are reality for folks in the criminal justice system. Beautiful. So here I can't, I, I feel like I paid you all to anticipate the next thing. I love this. Um, and then beautiful Masami, thank you. There's this idea of there being a tension around power if it's viewed as a limited resource within a zero sum game, beautiful. So if we, if we are looking at power as something that some people hold and other people don't, then we also kind of, it's a reality. And then we also have an opportunity to give to our students the idea when people work together, power with, there is power there. So this is really interesting. Um, the reason I was having like this great like verbal whatever about Joe's comment um, is I just want to tease the continuity and change over time question just in case folks don't have this as part of their practice. Um, continuity and change over time is a portion of the APUS history. Uh, thank you, Chanda. Power within a really beautiful addition. Um, this is part of APUS history, and the intention here, just as I said at the top, is to be able to explain what has changed and what has stayed the same, and then also to consider why has the change or how has the change come to pass and kind of the things that we're allowed to continue, why, why is that? 
Um, and this analysis I have heard from many teachers is easiest, the change part is easiest to do and the continuity over time part is harder. Um, the thing that I want to, um, to tease for you is that this is the part I said at the beginning where you're gonna do the application, right? We did this kind of slow and steady move through the what are the systems, who are the people in the systems, what are their kind of perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. We did that collectively. And now you're gonna have an opportunity to do it independently and apply that thinking to a new artwork that as I said at the beginning is thematically connected. Um, I'm gonna play this video for you. And as I do, my invitation to you is on your piece of paper to write down all of the systems that the artist either mentions explicitly in the video or he alludes to within his artwork. And then you'll move through the individual work portion that you see on the bottom right. We'll have to move at a fairly rapid clip, I apologize. If you prefer to do this aloud as a group because you've hit a bump, that is totally fine. Just flag it in the chat box. I'm very flexible. We can make this whatever you want it to be. But the attempt here is to just try and apply this thinking routine to a new artwork. I'm going to unplug my um, my headphones um, so that you can hear the audio. And I'll just warn you that the fan on my computer is working really, really hard for some reason. So you might hear a whirring and that's just the fan. Um, so here we go. The materials that I use and have really always used have always been paper. The tools of civilization, how we build and destroy ourselves, are the materials that I'm really interested in. And paper is one of the main ways in which information is, is displayed. Paper in itself is simply a bunch of fragments held together by a binder. I always saw it as pigment dried in a binder and cut into eight and a half by 11 blocks. So just in my head, I thought, oh, well, you just have to wet it so that it can move like paint. What constitutes a painting sort of, and who, is the, who are the gatekeepers of that? I think that, I'm sure that me being a painter was a very political gesture for me. If you're black, and from South Central, you have a lot of like identity stuff that you can just fall right into. And I just thought I was going to do abstract work, but it was going to talk about race and class and culture and all these things, but I was going to do it from an, an, um, an abstraction place, which gave me freedom. And then I was going to look outside. I wasn't going to do this kind of hermetic interior close the world off which is historically what we understand abstraction as being i was going to have relationship with the world and with politics because i was interested in those things i was really starting to get very interested in the found the foundations of our country and the amendments or the bill of rights are still what we go to and interesting enough it is on paper i mean it is one of our historical documents, one of our most important documents are on paper. And also, we put paper in the, in the photo, photocopier. So it's both precious and not precious at all. It's both protected by security guards and, and, and shredded. So Amendment 8 is actually part of the Bill of Rights series. And there's certain fragments that cling to the edges of the composition. Certain words float in and out. They're legible and not legible. They hint. But in some ways, that's how we really do understand the dense documents. We don't, we will never fully understand. They're so dense, but we pull and we, we glimmer and we, we dive and, and we, we project onto these documents. And at the time, the, the Constitution, certain people weren't even human, women didn't have rights, so we move them forward as the country moves forward. We amend what we excluded in a way. What better place than the Smithsonian to have an amendment made? It just fits. It makes sense. If you look at what's going on in the media at the moment with, with um, black male bodies and me being a black male and doing an amendment painting and sitting in the Smithsonian, that's just super layered. 
All right, my friends. So let me make that go away. I'm going to back this up so you can see the painting. And we're just going to hold here. Um, I'm going to also plug in my headphones. Can you all? Can I get a yes in the chat box if you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so here's the challenge to you. You've hopefully got a couple of things written down on your paper about the systems that the artwork invokes or challenges. Just for clarity's sake, the text of the, amend the Eighth Amendment appears at the top right. The title of this work is Amendment Number Eight. Um, Mark Bradford made this um, in, I am blanking on the date, I apologize, 2014. The video that we just watched was recorded in 2017. Um, and the text of the Eighth Amendment says excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. So that's the, we're starting to think again, right? Like what is the historical context of the artwork? Um, what are the systems that are being um, called to our mind or challenged? And I, I'm gonna invite you to work through those um, bullets to get, uh, to, within yourselves, excuse me, independently. Um, I'll give you, let's look at the time. Given our time, let's do um, let's do four minutes and see what happens. Um, so four minutes to work through those last few bullets on your own, and then go back as at the very bottom as we did before and add any new ideas or um, questions to your quick write. It may be that you've started a new map because I wasn't clear and that's totally fine. Um, my intention just for clarity's sake here was that you would add these systems to the map that you've already created and start to think about how power or resources flow in and out of all of these systems um, together. If you didn't do that, that's okay. I wasn't clear at the top. And from a time management perspective, you've got about a minute left.
Okay, so in fairness, if you need another minute, feel free to let me know in the chat box, just like put a one in there. Um, but if you feel ready to move on, don't put a one and I'll just pause for a minute. Okay, so it seems like we, we don't need any more time, which is good. Um, so again, just as I did at the, at the last time, so, so when we kind of landed at the end of the thinking routine with the preamble artwork, I invited you in the chat box to add a new idea that you have about the interplay of people and systems of power. So again, I'm gonna use that kind of as a, as a a chorus or a refrain, we're going to kind of come back to it. So do you have any new ideas about the interplay of people and systems of power having done this um, analysis of amendment number eight? Will you put any of those new ideas in the chat box, please? For those of you who come to workshops with fair regularity with me, um, you've heard this before, I apologize. Um, but I recognize that I just asked you a really big question that might not have a ready answer. So just for like clarity and teacher talk's sake, if I ask that big question, I, I should probably give you time enough to think even though sometimes it makes me panic when things don't immediately go into the chat box. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you time to think and write about that idea of any new ideas that you have about the interplay of people and systems of power. So earlier in a reflection, Pierre noticed um, people receiving opportunities and safety, um, particularly um, it's kind of like the flow of, of power, I believe there um, regarding traveling goods, um, where the federal government also limits their, their it gives and it gives and it holds, right? Um, and I'm bringing that up now because Christy has added a new idea about philanthropists giving access um, to resources, particularly in what gets funded or put up on a public wall, which I think is a really interesting idea about how art changes perspective. So thank you for that. Any additional new ideas are of course most welcome. Ah, values about value. I love this, Chanda, you've got this idea in. We choose what um, has value, equity, life, truth, relationships, access, et cetera. So yeah, thinking about um, choice and agency, right? We have this idea of power. And if we're looking at power as not being entirely concentrated at the top in one place, but in fact, to use your phrase before, from before power within, starting to think about what do we choose um, has values. Peers noticing um, systems designed to protect are also protecting some over others. So definitely um, recognizing inequities and inequalities mm -hmm. at play, thank you. So we could go on and on, but I wanna be respectful and end on the dot. At the point here, we could spend probably the next hour having this conversation about what has changed over time and what has stayed the same. Um, because, you know, we've got the constitution which was ratified in 1788, not a hundred years, 200 years later, gosh, see my math is bad. Um, we have preamble, Mike Wilkins is revisiting the, the constitution with the preamble. Um, and then in 2014, Mark Bradford is revisiting, right? So this is, there's this revisiting and each time it's revisited, something has changed and something has stayed the same, right? Whether it's the material itself that the, the artist has selected to, um, to explore these ideas or alternatively the context around the artworks, but the artworks are a product of their, their time and they are responding to their time, right? 
So we could talk a bunch about what has changed over time and what has stayed the same. Where I want to end our time together today is in this place of wonder, of curiosity or questions. And so when we're starting to think about continuity and change over time, instead of trying to answer a question, what questions, whether they be research questions or philosophical questions or personal questions or whatever, what wonders or questions surface for you? Will you put a wonder or question in the chat box or alternatively unmute yourself and share your voice? I love that. Wouldn't that be interesting? Marita's got to wonder about whether Mike Wilkins and Mark Bradford are aware of each other. Uh, Christy is curious about gaps, right? Gaps in knowledge. If we don't know what we don't know, how do we see our own ignorance? Um, particularly, thank you for calling out. There are some systems that we don't interact with, or at least not directly enough to be able to see them. Thank you for that note. Helene is curious about gaps of knowledge, particularly about the Constitution, um, becoming only aware um, of when rights are threatened. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so there's the idea of like, I didn't know this was my right, but don't take it away from me. Um, or I didn't know how this worked, but I just don't take it away from me. Um, Aha, thank you, Joe. So recognizing the limitations of our own personal experience. Um, Joe and I are both white. He identifies as male, I identify as female, um, and Joe is curious about what, what it's like to get pulled over by a police officer in a regular routine traffic stop as an African American in this country. Thank you. Yeah. Additional wonders are most welcome, of course. Piers curious, I wonder how we can expand opportunities for access to arts and ideas. I love this. Beautiful. Julianne's curious about what the art will reflect 20 years from now as it relates to the Constitution. So what an interesting opportunity, especially for um, students who are still in grade school to recognize that there is a future, that stuff is going to keep changing over time. Um, it's not just stuck in the way that we're experiencing it now, um, and particularly with this emphasis on agency and identifying opportunities and ways that we engage with these systems of power is also an invitation to start thinking about, okay, how do I participate and do I want to participate that way? Is there, is there a power that I have that I can exercise in order to make a change? Um, beautiful. So um, Chanda is, asked, is wondering aloud about um, what more I can do to participate in progress and continue moving forward and not become overwhelmed. Thank you. Of course, this idea of overwhelm when we start to identify all these systems of power that cause um, the pain or, or support that they do and recognizing that there's, even if they're positive, there's opportunities for refinement and, and progress. It's like, oh, there's a lot there, right? Um, so if we had more time, um, we could look back um, to the very beginning. And the beauty of doing the quick right at the top is that, and, and encouraging you to go back to it over time, is that you can actually track how your thinking changed. And when we have the opportunity to see how our thinking changes, it's an, it's an opportunity also to recognize, ah, this is a pattern, I followed this pattern, when else might this pattern be useful? So recognizing continuity and change over time is really a question that happens everywhere. It's about inven invention, innovation, right? That's a change over time. But wheels, wheels are good, we're gonna hang on to those, right? But the cars that ride on the wheels change, right? So that this, this kind of metacognitive moment, this reflection at the end is intended to be a way for us to start transferring the pattern of thinking that we've done together here to other venues and spaces. But since our conversation was so rich, I'm just gonna leave it here with the idea that there is opportunity for reflection I'm going to put a plug in for um, a show that we have come uh, upcoming, which is um, called Chicano Graphics Printing the Revolution. Um, and it, you can find it on our website. 
they are all permanent collection artwork. So they're all works um, that are in Sam's um, collection. And they're really fantastic. Um, they cover a bunch of different decades and ways of engaging with um, artist, artistic voice, um, historical um, experiences, and also a variety of perspectives on those experiences. So just know that that's coming up and it's accessible entirely on our website. Um, I am going to stop the recording with a thank you. Um, and I'm going to stay on for oops, um, a little bit longer. Stop the recording. <laughs>